Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will state and prove all the Silo's theorems. Okay. So, let us see the statement of Silo's theorems. So, recall first uh, what is the Lagrange's theorem. So, one can think uh, the very first Silo's theorem as a partial converse of Lagrange's theorem. So, Lagrange's theorem states the following. Okay. For any subgroup h of g we have order of h divides order of g ok. As I said before uh, silo theorems in uh, are only for finite groups. So, we assume all the groups involved in this talk are all finite groups ok. So, to begin with g is a finite uh, group. So, this is what uh, Lagrange's theorem says. Okay. So, now one can ask this question. So, if you fix this uh, cardinality of the group, okay, suppose if you know that the cardinality of group is n and then if you fix a divisor d of n. Okay. So, d is just a divisor. So, one can ask this question whether there exists a subgroup of order d in G. Okay. So, this is the converse whether there exists a subgroup of order d in G. So, this is the question. So, we already seen this converse is not true. Okay. So, we looked at uh, uh, this alternating group of size uh, A4 and then we, we proved that there is no subgroup of order 6 inside A4. So, A4 has the cardinality, cardinality of S4 divided by 2 which is 4 factorial divided by 2. So, that means it is 4 into 3 which is 12. Okay. 6 divides 12 but there is no subgroup of order 6 inside A4. So, the converse of Lagrange's theorem is not true. So, the converse of Lagrange's theorem is not true. Okay. So, then what is about some partial converse? Okay. So, we already seen this Cauchy's theorem. So, what Cauchy's theorem says? If you have, okay, recall. <coughs> recall if you have a divisor p for this order of the group okay and p is a prime number so then we proved that there exists a subgroup of order p there is a subgroup of g of order p okay so that is what cauchy's theorem says So, that means, uh, some partial converse of Lagrange's theorem is true. Okay. If the divisor is prime number, then we have the converse. So, now what Silo asked whether it can be generalized to some prime power. Okay. So, first we will state this result for actually the highest prime power that is dividing the order of the group. Okay. So, then uh, we will see later for any prime power that must be true. Okay, so, let me state the Silo's theorem. So, here is the first statement I call it S1. Okay, so, before that let us fix some notations. So, let us say that the order of the group is exactly some p power k times m. Maybe I will use, yeah, it is fine and then where m and p they are relatively prime. So, what is the meaning of that? p is a divisor. Okay. So, we assume that this k is also greater than or equal to 1 otherwise there is nothing to say. Okay. So, this k is also greater than or equal to 1. So, p is the divisor of this order of g and then p power k is the highest power of p uh, such that p power k divides the order of g. So, that means p does not divide m. So, p and m are relatively prime. So, this is there. So, then uh, we can state the first theorem. The first Silo's theorem actually guarantees that there exists a subgroup of there exists a subgroup 
h of g of order p power k okay such groups are called such subgroups are called silo p subgroups okay such subgroup is called silo p subgroup of g okay so this is very important uh, statement so now let us state the second theorem okay the second actually statement of this silo theorem states that, that it compares two different silo p subgroups so you fix p and then look at silo p subgroup silo p subgroup by definition it is a subgroup of g such that order of that group is some p power of prime p power k where p power k is the highest prime power that divides r of g so now you take two different silo p subgroups okay so take uh, two different groups call it h and k so any two silo p subgroups let's say h and k of g are conjugate so that is there exists g in g such that g h g inverse equal to k so note that uh, if we take this set of all silo p subgroups so then we are saying that the group g is acting on that set of all p silo group silo group via the conjugation and that that action is transitive action so that's what the statement 2 says okay and since they are all conjugate under uh, some elements of g so you can see that they are naturally isomorphic to each other okay they are not just uh, some subgroups okay so they are all isomorphic subgroups so that is what the statement 2 says the statement 3 so this is about the number of such uh, silo p subgroups okay so if we denote k by the number of silo silo p subgroups of uh, this g of course up to isomorphism there is only one because all of them are conjugate so now we are counting it as different distinct subgroups okay so if you take the number of silo p subgroups as subgroups of g that you denoted by k so then you can prove that so then we have p this k is congruent to 1 modulo p so in particularly k and p they are relatively prime and k is congruent to 1 modulo p so we call this is uh, silo first theorem second theorem and third theorem so they are very very fundamental results uh, for finite groups okay so one can use like i said one can use these results to determine uh, groups of order group of small order and uh, we will also see many interesting applications of silo theorem in finite abelian groups theory and so on okay so the statements are uh, i believe very clear okay you write order of g as some p power k times m where k is the highest power of p uh, such that p power k divides order of g and then because of that the m and p they are relatively prime so in that case you have a subgroup of g of order p power k so that subgroup is called silo p subgroup so if you take two such uh, subgroups that is having order p power k they must be conjugate to each other in particularly they are isomorphic to each other but if you count the silo p subgroups as distinct subgroups of g then that counting that uh, uh, that will have exactly Uh, if you call it k that will have this property k is relatively prime with p not only that k is congruent to one modulo p okay so these are the three statements of silo theorems so let's prove this uh, one by one so the proof of s1 okay so to prove this uh, so let us first look at some uh, uh, silo p subgroup okay one can assume the existence l and then try to see like uh, 
uh, how one can prove such statement ok. So, if you look at uh, uh, this group ok uh, g, so the g has this order p power k times m ok. So, the order of the group is p power k times m. So, this is just uh, some motivation ok. So, motivation for the proof. So, in case you have this h which is a subgroup of G such that the cardinality of H is p power k. Then from Lagrange's theorem it is immediate that the cardinality of G modulo H is going to be exactly M. But G mod H is what? G mod H is going to be all possible left cosets of this H. Okay. So, if you take all this left cosets they all have same cardinality as H. Okay. So, G is naturally acting on this G mod H, okay. it is an invariant uh, subset, uh, but you can see that there is this bigger set okay, on which also G acts. So, that is what we denoted by sigma k okay, or let us call it sigma. So, what is sigma? Sigma those subsets of G such that the cardinality of S is exactly p power k. Okay. So, I am looking at all possible subsets of G that has exactly cardinality p power k. So, we already seen G acts on sigma via this left multiplication. So, take G dot capital S to be just G S. So, this is action that we have already defined. So, now we already seen that if H is a subgroup of G, so then the orbit of this H okay, you under this action. So, this action that uh, we are going to use under this action the orbit is going to be. So, those conjugates like left cosets of this H in G. So, that is going to be exactly G mod H. So, because this G mod H is a orbit. So, this is going to be G invariant subset of sigma. So, this is sitting inside sigma, but what is the property of this orbit? The property of the orbit is exactly the, the cardinality of the orbit is exactly the cardinality of G mod H which is going to be M. Note that P does not divide M. So, that is the property. Okay. So, if you look at this orbit you can see that P is not dividing the cardinality of this orbit. And another thing you can easily check if you look at this stabilizer of H, okay, the stabilizer of this H inside G. Okay. So, this is something we have worked out already. This is going to be those G in G such that G H is going to be H. Okay. But uh, H is being a subgroup will imply that this G H is going to be exactly H. So, H can be realized as stabilizer of this H okay, under this action. So, this sigma this G acts on this sigma and then this H is being a subgroup of G such that the H having cardinality p power k makes it H belongs to the sigma. If you look at the stabilizer of this H you get back H. So, this motivates us to look for this particular action and then look for some orbit satisfying this property. Okay. So, that is that p does not divide p does not divide the orbit of uh, the cardinality of the orbit. So, then look at the some fix some element in that orbit and then look at stabilizer of that orbit. Okay. So, we expect that should do the work. Okay. So, let us try to prove okay, here is the proof. So, the proof starts here, okay, the real proof. So, see that G acts on sigma, S is S is subset of G having exactly cardinality P power K. So, then what is the cardinality of sigma? Cardinality of sigma is going to be you are choosing all possible subsets of G that are having p power k elements. What is the cardinality of G? Cardinality of G is p power k times m. 
So, it is going to be exactly p power k times m choose p power k. So, this is going to be the cardinality of sigma. So, you have this natural action of g on this sigma given by g dot s equal to g s the left multiplication this is the action. Okay. So, now what we want to do uh, you can you know that the sigma can be actually partitioned into orbits. Okay. You can write the sigma as disjoint union of orbits disjoint union of orbits. Okay. Now, using this orbit decomposition you can see that sigma can be written as the cardinality of sigma is summation the cardinality of all the orbits where orbits runs over some let us say 1 to r there are r orbits. Okay. So, now uh, you can see that uh, this p power k m choose p power k. So, this is indeed congruent to m modulo p. Okay. So, this I will check later. Okay. So, this is a fact we will verify in a minute. Okay. The fact actually states p power k m choose p power k. So, if you if you take this number, this number is exactly congruent to m modulo p. Okay. So, in particularly p does not divide the left hand side p power k m choose p power k. So, p does not divide the cardinality of sigma. Okay. So, this immediately implies this because m is relatively prime as m is relatively prime with p. If p, p divides this cardinality of sigma then m is congruent to g model, 0 modulo p that is absurd. So, since p does not divide uh, this cardinality of sigma so that would imply immediately p does not divide the cardinality of sigma there exist i such that p does not divide one of the orbit cardinality of the one of the orbit. Okay. So, fix such orbit fix such orbit call it O okay. and then choose some element choose some element yes in that O. Okay. You just fix some element here. So, in particularly O becomes O s. Okay. So, now you take this G s which is the stabilizer of this s in, inside G. So, this is going to be a subgroup inside G. Okay. So, this is our subgroup. Okay. So, now uh, we want to claim that this is the subgroup that we wanted. Okay. The, sub, the group that we have here is going to be exactly having p power k elements. So, let us let us try to verify that. Okay. So, this is our silo p subgroup that is our claim. So, let us look at what is the cardinality of this. Okay. The cardinality of O s is going to be cardinality of g divided by cardinality of g s. So, this is by orbit stabilizer theorem. Okay. This is by orbit stabilizer theorem. Okay. So, now if you look at this equation you can see that p power k times m is exactly equal to cardinality of O s times cardinality of G s. But what we have p does not divide the cardinality of O s that means whatever power you have here that should be dividing this cardinality of G s. Okay. So, this immediately implies p power k divides the cardinality of g s. So, that immediately implies that p power k is less than or equal to the cardinality of g s. Okay. So, the cardinality of uh, this stabilizer is indeed having at least p power k elements because p does not divide this uh, cardinality of the orbit. Okay. So, so we wanted to prove that uh, the stabilizer actually having exactly p power k elements we proved one way 
and we want to really compute uh, what happens to uh, the stabilizer okay let us call this is h okay just to simplify the notation. So, recall this is exactly those g and g such that it fixes this capital S capital S is a set capital S is a set that having exactly p power k elements okay. So, this S is just a subset of g so this is just a subset. But since this h actually leaves this S invariant okay this equation actually tells okay whenever you take some element x in capital S g in h then g x is in S that means we have this following action. So, h naturally acts on capital S via this left to multiplication again. So, you take h and then you take x ok. So, and then you say that h dot x is just h x. So, this is for h in h and x in capital S. So, now this gives you new action of h on s ok. This is since again left to multiplication it is easy to verify this is an action. So, now h is acting on s ok in particularly if you take some s naught inside s look at the orbit ok inside this h what is this this is those h dot s naught where h in capital H ok. So, you can see that this orbit with respect to this action is going to be h s naught h in h. So, this is a subset of s that is all we know. So, now again use orbit stabilizer theorem ok one more time you use. So, the cardinality of this orbit now computed using orbit stabilizer theorem. So, this is going to be exactly equal to the cardinality of h divided by the cardinality of h s naught what is h s naught it is those elements of h that fixes s naught ok. So, this is what this but this is going to be less than or equal to the cardinality of s which is p power k. So, let us compute what is h s naught h s naught is going to be those h in h. So, because this is stabilizer of s naught in h ok. So, this is the stabilizer of s naught in h. So, this is those h in h such that h s naught equal to s naught, but h s naught is just left to multiplication we are in the group only we are in the group g h s naught equal to s naught is going to give you by cancelling s naught h equal to identity. So, this that means this is exactly is identity. So, that means the orbit is exactly h the cardinality of the orbit is exactly the cardinality of h which is less than or equal to p power k. But if you go back we already have one other uh, inequality. So, this is the cardinality of h ok. So, we already have p power k is less than or equal to cardinality h and here we are saying that the cardinality of h is less than or equal to p, k, p power k. So, that proves h is having exactly cardinality p power k. So, since h is realized as stabilizer of something so it must be a subgroup so h is a subgroup so that is already we have so that means in from this proof we can see that so by acting g naturally on this set of all subsets of g that are having p power k and choosing the orbit properly so choose the orbit such that this p does not divide the orbit from that we we actually got uh, this subgroup which uh, which has exactly cardinality p power k. So, the upshot ok let me write it here. So, make g act on this sigma which is those subsets of g such that the cardinality of s is p power k. So, then look at choose orbit of sigma ok orbit of course, with respect to this action such that p does not divide the cardinality of the orbit. Then choose s is in this orbit look at this g s which is the stabilizer of this particular s inside 
this group G. Then this is a subgroup of G. We proved that the cardinality of Gs is exactly p power k, and in particularly Gs is a silo p subgroup of G. Okay, so this is what we have proved. So let us look at this uh, very closely, and then we try to understand what happens to the orbit. But before that, uh, we still need to check this fact. Okay, this is something we we assumed. So if you if you take this number uh, p power k times m choose p power k, so that must be congruent to m modulo p. So let's see how one can prove this. So this is basically uh, doing uh, arithmetic modulo p. And uh, we have to do it uh, using the polynomials. Okay, so let's recall one plus x power n is nothing but what using the binomial expansion. You can see that this is exactly equal to n choose n choose r x power r r varies from zero to n. So this is just binomial expansion. So where n choose r is nothing but n factorial divided by r factorial n minus r factorial. So now let's compute what happens to n plus x power p power k times m. Okay, so if you do this modulo p, this is going to be exactly equal to <coughs> okay one plus x power p power k power m modulo p okay or inside ej modulo g p p ej so this is something i will leave it to you to verify okay so modulo uh, this uh, thing so what it says that uh, when you raise it power p power k okay so basically this follows from the following fact if you take A plus B power P. So if you go modulo P, then it is going to be A power P plus B power P modulo prime P. Okay, so this is something you can verify, and from this you can conclude this. You raise it power again and again, you see that you get this. Okay, and this is again just comes from the binomial expansion because every time you will be having P choose R. When R is actually not uh, not equal to zero or not equal to P, you will be having exactly P device this P choose up. So this just uses P device P choose R for R not equal to zero and P. So now if you raise it power again, A plus B power P square. Okay, this is going to be A power P plus B power P. Power p, so this is congruent to this modulo p. So then you can see that this will become again congruent to a power p square plus p power p square modulo p. Okay, so from this you get this, and then by induction you can prove that one plus x power p power k times m is congruent to 1 plus x power p power k power m modulo p. Now again use binomial expansion. Then you can see that the coefficient of this p power k m. Okay, so in this polynomial, so in 1 plus x power, sorry, 1 plus 1 plus x power p power k power m in this polynomial, the coefficient. Of x power p power k times m is exactly m. Okay, so that means you can see that. So, but on the left side here, so the coefficient, same coefficient is going to be. We are going to calculate the coefficient wise. Right? The coefficient of p power k x power p power k m. In one plus x power p power k times m. Okay, we want to uh, 
sorry we will calculate uh, the coefficient of x power p power p power k only not p power k so this is just x power p p power k and here also it is going to be x power p power k so the coefficient of x power p power k in 1 plus x power uh, p power k times m it, this is exactly equal to p power k m choose p power k so this is going to be exactly congruent to m modulo p because this is the coefficient here on the right side here okay that is what we have proved so that proves that this p power k m choose p power k is actually indeed congruent to m modulo p okay this is verified so that actually completes the proof of uh, first silos theorem so let's make one small observation and then stop okay so if we take uh, uh, this uh, orbit uh, that we have chosen okay let's see like uh, what can we say more about that orbit so if you recall the sigma is written as union of orbits and then we have chosen o which is an orbit such that this p doesn't divide the cardinality of the orbit so then we have chosen s from the orbit and then we immediately observe that o equal to os and our h is nothing but the stabilizer okay so now if you take some other t inside your orbit okay so let uh, some other t then let's see what happens to this okay so you can see that uh, this t is going to be some gs for some g in capital g okay so then uh, we are going to say that so from our proof we already seen that so this h acts on this capital s and if you fix some s not in capital s then we we saw that uh, this h s not is going to be identity and this o s not h is naturally has bijective correspondent with h in particularly this o s not h is going to be s yes. so we have a natural map from h to this s yes given by h goes to h s not so that means this s can be identified with h s not okay this is actually very clear from our proof because you look at this action of h on this capital s so this is what we get from the proof so in particularly we want to compare what happens to some other element t in o okay so t will be just a gs so now if you do uh, some computation then you can see that so this t is going to be exactly equal to g h s not which is exactly g s not s not inverse okay maybe you can write it like this s not inverse h s not so that means if you take this element to be some a so then the t can be identified as a times some k where k is just the conjugate of this h okay so in particularly what we have seen so any element any element t of this orbit o can be realized as is equal to left coset of this k left coset of this k where k is given by this specific group s not inverse h s not note that this s not is already fixed that is coming from this capital s okay and k is a subgroup k is a subgroup of g. that is obvious because it's a conjugate of h so that means what it says okay i will leave it to verify okay this is already there in the proof this o can be identified as okay so this is exactly equal to g modulo k 
So, it is not just uh, some uh, orbit, it is indeed the orbit uh, that naturally comes from some subgroup. Okay. So, because that is what our motivation said. Na? So, if we start with uh, uh, group H having this property, then we saw that this G mod H can be realized as the orbit. Okay. So, that is that is what here also we are saying. So, note that the cardinality of k is same as cardinality of h which is exactly p power k. So, in particularly the cardinality of the orbit is going to be cardinality of g divided by the cardinality of k which is going to be m. So, the orbit that we have chosen such a way that p does not divide the cardinality of the orbit forces that the cardinality of the orbit must be equal to m. So, this is all inbuilt in the in the construction. Okay. It is not some random orbit, it is just orbit that is having exactly m number of elements and this orbit also comes from the left co set of some silo p subgroup. Of course, now we have chosen some different silo p subgroup which is conjugate of h. Okay. So, that is the observation that we are making. It is not some the way that we choose that we have chosen seems to be somewhat arbitrary, but this p does not divide the orbit of this uh, the cardinality of the orbit forces that this orbit is nothing but g mod k for some k silo p subgroup. So, this is very important observation this will be used later. Okay, I will stop here and I will actually continue with the uh, proof of second and the third silo theorem in the next class. Thank you.